Hey everyone, welcome to Geo for Hub webcast. Today's guest is going to be Reed Summers. I will be talking to him about Allies of Humanity, which is a body of work that was started by his father, Marshall Summers, back in the late 70s. And as always, I'm going to let the guests get into the background information. So let's get to it. Welcome, Reed. Thanks for being on. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Well, so I'm glad we're able to connect. I know it's been um, several several months now that we've been trying to figure out a date and time. So I'm glad today is the day. So um, as usual, I would like to just ask you if you can go a little bit into your background information. Yeah, sure. Um, well, for the last 10 years, I've been working with my father, Marshall Vion Summers, on presenting a very new perspective regarding contact who is in our world, what they're doing and why, and a preparation for contact that everyone and anyone can, can use and bring into their life to help them prepare for what probably is the biggest event in human history, which is contact with non-human intelligent life in the universe. So read the initially the, the, the books, um, Allies of Humanity, there's four volumes, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. So in 1997, my father, uh, received the first set of briefings from a group of observers, extraterrestrial observers, who came to the vicinity of the Earth to observe the alien intervention underway in our world and report on its activities. And these individuals called themselves the Allies of Humanity. And in 1997, they gave their first set of briefings, and then that was followed by three more sets of briefings. And so there are now four books from the Allies of Humanity, uh, which detail in, in great depth uh, the activities of those visiting our world who have been present in our world for over 60, 60 years and, um, and what their agenda is, how they're accomplishing that agenda, and where we stand uh, as the Native peoples facing that. Well, Reed, I'd love to get into some of that with you. Um, I first want to ask you more about you. Uh, when you first started working with your father, is that something that you felt inclined to do or how did that come about? You said, what, 10 years ago? Yeah, it was, you know, kind of mysterious. Um, well, and, and not. Um, I, I am Marshall's son. So Marshall was doing this for, you know, for many, many years, all throughout my childhood, receiving this communication, presenting it, presenting it forums like MUFON and doing numerous radio interviews and trying to educate people about the gravity of contact and, and what we need to be doing about it. Uh, so I grew up in that and I saw my father doing that work and that I think deep that, that moved me though I didn't know it moved me or it inspired me though I wasn't aware of that inspiration uh, for many years. So I, I went off and I was, um, I was, in college, taking on my own career path, and I just had this gut knowing that I needed to to get back home and help Marshall present the Allies of Humanity briefings. And this was building for me for some time. Um, and that actually happened back in 2004. So, gosh, help me out with the math on that. Uh, that's a long time ago. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't know, 17 years ago. Um, and so, but, you know, twists and turns in my life took me away for a few years. Um, but in the back of my mind, I always knew how important it was what these briefings presented to the world, the perspective they offered. I knew that, you know, an, an enormous percentage of people on planet Earth care about contact, believe we're being visited. And, and everyone, even if they don't believe that, may have an innate knowing or a gut sense that this is actually happening or may happen and that it will be really big when it does. And so here my father for some years has been working to present this information and this preparation to people. And I, I just realized this will really help the world. This is one thing, this is something I need to do. Uh, and so I chose to, to cancel my plans, uh, back out of what I was doing with my life at that, at that time and, and come back to help my father. And um, so, 10 years later, here I am. I think I just hit the 10 year anniversary uh, back in March, maybe. Um, and so, I mean, this is it, this is huge. Contact, what could be bigger? And so, and if you've got something like the Allies of Humanity briefings that is really important for people to hear, this is what I would, would wanna be doing uh, with my life. 
So in the description below, I'm going to have your links, uh, the link to the Allies uh, of Humanity web webpage. Um, and again, I'm sorry, help me out again. Sovereignty. Declaration Stop. of Human Sovereignty. Declaration of Human Sovereignty and the 12 points of the, the briefing. So I'm going to have those available in the description and I hope and encourage everyone to check those out. Now, Reed, what I wanted to, um, to ask you, uh, can you maybe go a little bit into how did your father initially receive this information? Yeah, long story. Um, takes us back to the 80s, early 80s. I'm sorry, the late 70s when Marshall was... Um, a teacher for the blind. Uh, and he was a very skilled instructor working with those with these, these physical disabilities. And during the course of that work, this voice experience began to emerge for him, this, this voice guiding him how to work with people, how to respond to people very dynamically. You could call this the voice of intuition, or higher consciousness, or, or, or even an angelic voice. And at the time, Marshall didn't know quite what it was, but he followed that. And in time, that became something of a connection or a line to a higher set of powers that actually were intending to guide him. And so he followed that guidance. Um, these individuals guiding him at that time, he called the unseen ones. The allies of humanity referred to the unseen ones as well. Uh, essentially, an angelic presence that abides with all people in the world and guides those of us who can receive guidance. So over many years, Marshall followed that and that emerged into a teaching. And then a very sudden and powerful revelation occurred for him toward the end of that process. And that revelation in some ways shattered his life to that moment in terms of his associations, everything he thought he was doing. And it, and it really began a whole new journey. And um, that revelation was a set of instructions to record a series of messages for humanity from an angelic source. And so Marshall embarked on that new journey. And that has yielded what is now called the new message from God, which is a set of revelations from a higher power regarding humanity's place in a larger universe, uh, our current stage of evolution into that larger greater community, as it calls it, and many, many, many other topics of, of great interest uh, for people. I mean, the new message covers almost every topic imaginable. Uh, it's over 9,000 pages in length at this point. He's been receiving it for over 34 years. And so I know that doesn't sound very connected to the Allies, but it, it takes us there. And so the new message, its core and em its core focus and emphasis is really about our emergence into a larger universe, what it calls the greater community, and the contact that we would have eventually with life in that universe, and how that would be really the greatest leap this race has ever taken and may ever take, and a very risky one at that, uh, a leap requiring you know preparation and instruction and teaching. And so the new message delivers um, quite a preparation and a teaching and instruction regarding how we can safely emerge into this universe of life, a universe of powerful influences, a universe of nature, uh, but on a much grander scale than we can even imagine. And at the same time, the new message spoke of the reality of contact happening now. And what this contact was, was not just visitation, friendly visitation. It is an intervention. We're making first contact with those from the universe who have made the long journey to earth because they want something from us. And what do they want? That's a question many people I'm sure on your show have, have wondered. And so what has occurred is uh, the allies of humanity, a group of free worlds in the vicinity of the earth in our local, local region of space, have, have seen this intervention occur and have been called to send a group of observers to report to us on its activities. And the same higher power that brought the new message from God into the world and that moves in people around the world even right now also called the allies of humanity to be here, to give their testimony, which only they could give, being physical beings in our universe. And so in 1997, probably... Uh, 15 years after the new message was 
began to be received by Marshall, the Allies came with their first set of briefings. How he receives this, going back to your initial question, um, it is a communication delivered over a spiritual channel without interference or the potential for mechanical or, um, yeah, mechanical interference by any, by any force. That's how the Allies describe it. For Marshall, he enters a state of connection. He, the Allies come into his space and the voice just flows right through him and their message is recorded and transcribed word for word. And that's what you see in the Allies briefings. And so um, I've, I've heard of the Allies of Humanity uh, several years back, and um, it's, it's uh, quite a bit different than the, the, the normal messages that some of the people want, want to convey. And um, it's, it's all about, you know, love and light and, um, you know, let's all just kind of, you know, come together in, in peace and, and all of that. Uh, but uh, I felt, had a feeling that Allies of Humanity just has like a, a little bit of a tone of just caution, you know, to not just be too free willy nilly. Am I, am I correct in that assumption? Yeah. Yeah, no, you are. I mean, the Allies describe contact as an event of nature. It's, it's, yes, we are spiritual beings in a spiritual universe. Yes, love is maybe the greatest power and we must follow it. But this is an event of nature. We're making contact with physical beings coming to our planet of origin, undertaking numerous clandestine activities, many of which, if not all of which, signal do not signal a beneficial intent, let's just say that, and may signal a, a negative intent. And so we need to engage with that very seriously and soberly and not confuse levels of reality, you know, spirituality, physical reality. This is an event of nature. And when we go back into the history of our world, look at the native peoples, North America, South America, Southeast Asia, Japan, elsewhere, when they made first contact with other peoples, it was often with resource explorers, predatory groups of individuals coming to take something that the natives had or to exploit something if possible. And so uh, that is borne out time and time again in our natural history or, or human history, I should say. So the Allies counsel us to be very cautious as we step into the universe and not make big assumptions, not expect salvation, not expect the fulfillment of our religious prophecies. Uh, but to start with really the first question, which is we're being visited by physical beings with technological powers far beyond our own. Who are they? What are they doing? What do they want? Those are the first questions. And so they, they advise us to start there. But what you're saying, Adnan, and I agree is, you know, in this field of study and inquiry, people jump to wild associations with, with extraterrestrial life you know, saying they're here to save us, you know, they're enlightened, they've transcended the need for conflict, you know, just so many assumptions um, that are quite dangerous if, if we allow them to, to take us down the road uh, of contact. Um, do they reveal specifically uh, which, which different groups have more of that um, ill intent and uh, also then at this, or the other side of the coin, which groups, you know, are more uh, here to interact with us on a peaceful level? Yeah, well, here's what the Allies say. Um, the Great War, World War II, the last great global conflict, along with the detonation of nuclear weapons and the destruction of our natural environment in the decades to follow, were the precipitating events that brought a new set of forces to our shores. Before that, yes, there was ancient contact. There were neighbors visiting to observe other races coming to maybe take some biological resources for experimentation, efforts to educate the locals and, and, and a variety of, you know, scattered attempts to engage with humanity, but nothing global and pervasive, an effort to literally shift the direction of the whole planet and its destiny in space. And so with, with nuclear war or the risk of nuclear war, and the destruction of our environment, a new set of forces arrived. The Allies of Humanity call these the collectives. And these are multiracial economic forces who are here to take advantage of a beautiful planet Earth, abundant, rich in biological resources, rare in the universe, before the native peoples destroy it. And, um, and so they're 
here to, to take what they can and to bring humanity and this planet into their sphere of influence, protect the planet, but for their uses and put us to work for those ends. So that's who's here now. Um, the allies do say that, yes, there are other friendly races in our vicinity of space. We do have neighbors who are neutral, but these groups have pulled out of the planet or of planet Earth or this, you know, of our environment so that we could have an unambiguous situation to respond to. Otherwise, there's numerous races here, numerous accounts about who they, what they look like, where star, their star system they're from. Nobody knows what's up, what's down. I mean, in essence, you know, our friends know that they can't just step in and militarily protect us. We have to protect ourselves. We're the natives of this world. Uh, and so they have pulled out largely so that humanity could have an unambiguous situation and deal with that. And then that would hopefully prepare us for beneficial contact down the road. So, um, you know, a lot of times when, um, you know, just, just taking the, the human point of view and our imagination regarding first contact, a lot of times it's betrayed that these different races have advanced technology that, um, sometimes we can't even match and uh, and of course with independence day if we do some ad you know adaptation we can um when you said to for us to protect ourselves uh, would would that be even a chance on our end or is are we talking about some technology that was provided by some of the good good guys to kind of help us out in case it's needed well the allies of humanity say that technology is not what's going to protect us the collectives are so far beyond us technologically. Have they given things or sold things to certain entities and certain governments? I'm sure they have. Those are not game changing pieces of technology regarding intervention. You know, those might be trinkets from space, you know, very, very profitable for us here, but not that important to them up there. Um, so there's no technology that the intervention has given that the allies of humanity can give or that we can develop that can offset or repel this intervention in our world. What the allies call for us to do is to become aware that contact is underway and that it is with forces of a negative intent who are here for the resources of this world to claim the world and its strategic position, which they do talk about, and then to, um, to bring us into their sphere of, of influence and their network, so to speak. Become aware of that. Second, to become educated about the local environment of space in which our world exists, how races function, how trade, travel, and conflict occur, all of which is fully revealed in the Allies briefings and in the new message. And then with that education, take action. And now we can talk about what would that action be that we could act effectively do to, to repel this intervention. Please do. Yeah. Well, what the allies of humanity, you know, say is it's, it's not picking up arms. It's not maybe what we think it is. Uh, and that's because of the nature of the intervention itself. The intervention is not a military force. It's not an invasion that we can see with our eyes. It is a pervasive form of influence being cast upon us in the mental environment, in the, in the psychological space. And so it's a, the intervention is a small group um, with the power to influence thought and emotion, to, to steer people's will and intention and their actions that stem from that. And so what the allies call for is for us to connect to the spiritual intelligence that we all carry, that we've all felt at various times in our lives, that can guide us to what we specifically need to do personally uh, in our lives in general, but also in response to the intervention, but also this spiritual mind that can protect us mentally, because this is the one part of us that cannot be manipulated by any force, even a force with unbelievable or unreal uh, powers to affect thought uh, by other beings. So the new message calls this spiritual force knowledge and the allies of humanity refer to this as well. It's the universal spiritual mind that all sentient life has. And it is by rooting ourselves in that, that our minds can be protected, that we can educate ourselves and take intelligent action, which most certainly must extend into uh, becoming vocal advocates for human freedom, for the preservation of the environment, 
um, for not subjugating to any power, foreign power, uh, and to and to deny and resist all their promises of peace, technology, salvation that they're making around the world and all countries, all traditions. The intervention has their tentacles everywhere. And so the work to repel that uh, must go on everywhere, but it has to be rooted in something that's not just fear or anger, um, just very reactive. It has to be rooted in something that is deep and powerful and confident and innately human that can actually help us win the long game here because we can win the short, we can try to win the short game, uh, but we're dealing with something of orders beyond in terms of their, their technological power and their mental power. And this won't be the last intervention. Even if we repel this one, there will be more. I mean, this is, it's just the non, it's the unstoppable process that begins when a young world steps out into the cosmos, makes first contact, which becomes second, third, and fourth, and fifth contact. So more intervention is coming. So we need something to help us win the long game. And the power of spirit, look at what it does already in the world, all over the world. I mean, I think we all know it's not just a philosophy or a, or a, you know, a plan or a playbook of, of strategic actions that's going to fix the climate crisis, that's going to get us out of the COVID crisis, you know, that's going to heal the divisions between nations in this world, that's going to temper the, the problem of religious extremism in the world. I mean, it's got to be something more and deeper. And that's, that's why the allies have, have given what they have. And that's why the new message from God is in the world. It, it takes a powerful medicine uh, from a higher power to cure an illness like this. Well, that brings me. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say that brings me to two questions. I figured I'll ask this one first. So would you, I guess, are you saying that if we simply um, would kind of stand our own ground and say, this is not what we wish as a society, that they would um, respect that and not necessarily take physical force? That's well, um, they may not respect it. I don't think they, I don't think they respect us. The allies have said that those visiting our world now view us like we view cattle. Mm. Okay. Not, not equal beings at all. And only interest, only interested in us if we're useful to them. So we are a resource to them. So it's a strange thing to be dealing with beings that, that have, that don't value our basic right to exist, that don't value our intelligence, our individuality. It's, it's very strange, but that's what it is. Um, but going back to your question, Adnan, I'm sorry, I forgot what it was. I was just going to say regarding, because um, I know you were saying they don't, they don't necessarily respect us, but because I was saying, would they respect our decision to not want to interact with them and not take any physical action? Since obviously we wouldn't be able to, to resist that. Right. Yeah. Well, they are a small force and they need our uh, acceptance and our, part and our participation, our willing participation. So if we become unwilling, then we are not fertile ground for what they're trying to achieve. So um, they wouldn't have the power to retaliate. They wouldn't have the power to cause destruction as a result of our rejection of their presence here. They would have to retreat. And so part of what they're trying to engender is our, our belief that they need to be here, that they have a right to be here. And because so, if we want them here, then all avenues open to them. If we do not want them here, all avenues start to close for them. Add to this that the allies um, say that in our local region of space, conquest is not allowed, that the native race has to be willing for those visiting to be there. They have to be participants. And so if we vocally reject their presence here, if we say we, you know, this, what's happening is not okay, human abductions are not okay, animal mutilations are not okay, tinkering with our militaries and, and making secret agreements with certain governments is not okay, if we start speaking out against that, then channels begin to close for them rapidly. And in time, if enough people speak up, there are forces beyond our world who will put a stop to the intervention uh, completely. Yeah, that was my, my second question then regarding what kind of influence are we talking about? So <clears throat> forgive me, I don't wish to make this political and um, this is just you know my opinion. 
but having been in the U.S. for a while and being, you know, involved with a lot of different things, for me, a lot of times the way I go about finding truth is first I have this um, gut feeling and then I follow it up with research. And so um, it just seems there's a lot going on, like almost like a very, very much like a script that's been written out that everybody's following in just in the past couple of years regarding COVID and all these other sort of things. And so would something like that be kind of the work of those hidden forces or, you know, can you maybe speak on that? Oh, sure. Well, they have a script for sure uh, for us to follow and they're trying to find their supporters and apologists um, who will follow that script. And so they're, they're, they're advocating for, our acquiescence to higher power, whatever that is, even if it's God, even if it's uh, an ancient prophet or Messiah, or if it's extraterrestrial. They're advocating for us to engage in conflict with one another, to make one another the problem so that they can be the saving solution. Uh, they're trying to encourage people to remain distracted with their own preoccupations, their own lives, their own interests, their own happiness. Uh, and they are directly influencing those thoughts and emotions that support that. They have a, what the Allies call the pacification program, which is um, a program projected in the mental environment, people being influenced to think certain things, to respond certain ways, especially in large population centers in the world. Um, and that is well underway and has been for some decades. More recent events, I can't say. You know, I can't say how COVID plays in to what the intervention is doing. Uh, my sense is that this is a, a naturally emerging virus. The risk of pandemic has been around for a long time. We've had we have pandemics. We have had one, you know, you know, frequently in the last 10, 20, 30 years. They just haven't been this potent and widespread. Um, the intervention will use that. They'll use everything and anything. And, and so anything we present to them as a source of conflict or disagreement, disassociation from one another, distrust of one another in our leadership institutions, they'll use it all. They'll use our religious beliefs, our belief in the return of, of Jesus Christ, the belief in that my religion should be the world's religion. I mean, the belief that, um, that we are higher beings and that love is what matters and we need to be loving with all. They'll use all of it and they'll twist all of it. And there's a lot of that going on. And so when you when you look into different you know, groups and circles on Earth, there is a strange distortion that you find in their messaging. It's pacifying. It's acquiescing. It takes power away from the individual. OK, it takes the prerogative for action and personal work away and just says, believe. Uh, it tries to stamp you with a label you know, or a hashtag or something to say, that's who you are. And so individual power and responsibility seems to be draining out of the human family. Um, and that, by the way, is the channel by which knowledge, the spiritual power works through lives. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what enables a great doctor to be a great doctor, is their individual responsibility and authority and take that into every field of life. So yes, I would say there is a script. Um, more and more people are following it. I can't myself say what po what political party or what world event plays into that. Uh, but the intervention has their has their fingers in many, many, many different places. Is there any information that you might have regarding this? I call this uh, soft disclosure by government because I feel, well, not feel. It's definitely what I, what I was able to read is that for the very first time they did not deny. UFOs, they just basically said, oh, we just need more funding and better ways to collect data. There was no denying like they used to. What, do you know anything about this or what this could possibly mean? I have my own personal thoughts uh, about it. Um, I'm sure I, we're all disappointed, right? We, we wanted something more and, and it, was, it was just another we don't know, but that's pretty meaningful. You know, it's almost admission by, by um, admitting that a phenomena exists and we don't know what it is, therefore, right? Therefore, we need to research it more and so forth. Of course, the government, this government in this country has been involved uh, with the intervention, either support, both supporting and resisting at various times for decades. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a bit fallacious for them to come out and say there's 140 some odd cases and we need to look into it more. Um, 
I like the word you use, which is soft disclosure. It, it, it does feel like disclosure. It feels like there is a plan here to potentially acclimate people to this as a real phenomenon um, and say, yes, it's real, but not say more. And then let people's wheels start spinning, let them start to create ideas that can then be shaped and steered. Um, so I do, I do sense the presence of disclosure in what's happened recently with these reports. Um, I, I've advocated in the past, don't wait around for the government to disclose what they know. Uh, they're not going to. And when they do, it's going to be what they want you to know about what they know to shape a narrative that they want in your mind and in the public's consciousness. So, um, I feel the allies are providing the disclosure we really need, which is the disclosure of the alien presence and their intent instead of our human governments and their intent, because the intervention is the big conspiracy behind other conspiracies. There are many true authentic conspiracies at work in the world, but the big one, the mother of them all is the presence of powerful extraterrestrial forces in our world who are here with an agenda working through governments, religions, commercial institutions, who are then spurring on their own, you know, attempts to capitalize on this perhaps, or to work with the alien presence. So what we need is the disclosure of the ET presence. Who are they? What are they doing? What are they, what is their end game? What are they attempting to achieve? That's the conversation that the ET presence does not want us to have. That's the forbidden conversation right there. It's all being steered now towards you know, conspiracy about human government and institutions, distrusting essentially our leaders and one another. Uh, and so I'm very wary of getting too deep into all of that, uh, knowing that behind all of that is the real actor. Um, and we can, we can pick fights with one another till, till the cows come home, but there is an invader in our world. Or put more intimately, there is an intruder in your house. It is, it's 10 p.m., the front door is open, and there's somebody in your house. And your kids are, are trying to go to bed down the hall, two doors down. And you're trying to go to bed upstairs. And something's telling you something's not right here. And that's, that's the reality of an intruder in the house. So until we deal with the intruder, I'm not sure I want to, you know, pick fights and, and get into all of that other stuff um, because I don't think we can resolve it. So I kind of have a, um, a two, two part again regarding the, you know, the, cause it, it's so many things you bring up that kind of always makes, you know, spurs so many other questions to go into. So would, so to, just to cover them, so I don't forget them myself. So first part would, would uh, basically then be for most people then to get in tune with, with, who we are to kind of go down that route to get in touch with this inner voice like your dad has to, in order to receive more accurate information. And then two, most people have not even had any context. I mean, as, as in my experience, as much information as we have out there and as much as you've talked about and I've all covered you know, in the show, uh, the vast majority of people still are not into this very much at all. And so, um, you know, to ask somebody to fight something that they don't even know their need to fight is, is um, would be kind of very difficult and counterproductive trying to convince everyone. So with the first defensive actions be of to kind of be watching what's coming down from authority to then to realize this is also then in this greater plan that eventually needs to be resisted or maybe scrutinized more. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to get, get at? I, I think I do. Yeah. Let's put the, the tapping into our own consciousness or knowledge at the end of the conversation, super important, but it's not the first step. I mean, the okay. first step is to alert as many people as possible to the fact that we are being visited and to root that revelation for them in the first question, which is, well, who's here? What are they doing here? And what are the, you know, what do they want? Versus people leaping to wild conclusions about spiritual, you know, spiritual fulfillment and angels and all of this other stuff. Uh, a lot of people need to know contact is underway and they need to be asking intelligent, rational questions that are rooted in, in, you know, the reality of a natural event taking place. Uh, and that's already happening. You know, I just saw recently 
that just under 50% of Americans believe that we've already been visited. Uh, it climbs over 60% in Russia and China. Uh, it's well over 50% in many countries around the world. So that's a lot of people already mm -hmm. feel certain that we've been visited. Have they asked the first question though? And then the second question, or are they, are they just, you know, stuffing it away because it's so taboo? Or are they diving in to some of these really wild, you know, conclusions and, and spiritual teachings that are out there regarding this? So public education is, I think, is the key. It's the first starting point. Um, and we need to start thinking like the native peoples of this world uh, and stop treating contact as an adventure in consciousness, you know, or as the next really wild out there, you know, next level event uh -huh, spiritually. Uh, so that's that's where it all begins, I think. Uh, it's it's public, it's alerting people in the public, and it's educating them. And it's starting to build a groundswell of kind of basic, rational response to this enormous event that's taking place. Did I answer your question there? Uh, yes. I was, I was just going to say regarding, uh, you know, um, I guess, I guess, yeah, definitely, because then that would be the first part to first make them aware then. Um, instead, because my idea with with almost anything in life is, I had my own drive uh, and and will and want to understand. So um, then I kind of took the steps towards that, and uh, whatever else happened to me in my life and my experiences. So um, I, but I don't. I've never felt like, hey, you sit down. I need to tell you something, you know. And so uh, and it's something that even to this day, I don't. I don't wish to do. It's like, it's almost like when the time comes, I'm here for you to let you know all that I know. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to kind of be this UFO door to door salesman, if that makes sense, you know, because it's, you know, but I figured by having information such as this interview and all of that just available online, that those that are searching will eventually find it, you know, and um, um, are you more suggesting a more hands on approach or what, you know, what, 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 what do you stand regarding that? Yeah, um, I, I get what you're saying, and I, I definitely feel you on that. It, it is awkward to be in possession of knowing this, and most people don't. Right. And not only they don't know, they don't want to know, and they don't want to hear you tell them. And so that's right. that's um, that's hard. You know, being being one of the first to know is difficult, um, and that's just something we have to walk with and and share with people as, like you're saying, when the time is right. I do think the time is now to get pretty hands-on with this. Um, there are many people who are very hands-on regarding government disclosure uh, and and demanding that, and I think that's okay because we we have <laughs> we do deserve the truth and we're not being given it. I just I would advocate redirecting that frustration and that need to know and that need to reveal upon the the alien presence itself and realize that the whole space has been poisoned with all sorts of false narratives, false conspiracies, a smokescreen of, of competing um, messaging from the intervention that's making it really hard, if not impossible, for the average person to step into this and, and come to see it for what it is. It's very hard to see this for what it is, even when it's so basically simple. We're being we're making first contact with extraterrestrial races. They're here for what they want. They have an agenda. Like, how can that be so hard? Well, it is. That's a problem. And I think we need to get very hands-on with that. And I think with the recent events uh, taking place in terms of soft disclosure uh, and public messaging on this, a lot, millions of people are coming into this field of inquiry regarding contact who weren't who maybe thought about it or had an interest in it, but now they want to know what's going on. But is it possible for them to know what's going on? Right, right. Well, actually, that brings me back then to the first question that I had, because once they asked themselves the first and second question, you know, um, they would then, you know, if they proceed, they would, you know, be obviously looking for information in the traditional way that we've always had, which is books, videos, other resources. And anyone that's been into, you know, ufology for any given amount of time, they'll know that, you know, there's thousands different perspectives. And so... Um, 
that's why I was asking initially in order to, to kind of discern between friend or foe and, and really have a solid base of how do you determine good information versus, you know, bad information, would, do, would that be part of the steps to get, kind of get in touch, you know, with your inner self and, and whatever else is out there that can guide you to know the, the proper information, the right information, as opposed to something that's, that's receiving. Because, I mean, that's how we kind of get, get ourselves in trouble all the time now. You know, we call that fake news, you know, but to who's deciding what's fake news? You know, that's the biggest issue because um, regarding a lot of information, I can find two different sources and each one of them blaming the other to be fake news. So it's very, very difficult to really get to the bottom of anything. And no wonder we're kind of in this uproar right now. Mm -hmm. Totally. And this is where knowledge comes in. I mean, we can't, we can't take that out of the conversation. You said yourself, Adnan, that you, you become aware of something and then you have a gut feeling or a, a gut sense. And then you research, you, you, you dive in. But it starts with that gut sense. That's knowledge. That is a, a spiritual mind, an intelligence that wants to steer you and me and everyone in a specific direction that's unique to us so that we can play our part in life and hopefully be of service to humankind uh, in a way that's relevant in the modern world. So a lot of people are feeling knowledge when they think about contact and when they look at this. Um, but again, it's so polluted. So I think, I, I think an emphasis on um, discerning the truth is really important. I have my own rubric for discerning the truth in a purported alien message, one of which is the Allies of Humanity briefings. There are many, many, many others, but there are some proofs that you can apply. And these are reasonable proofs um, and requirements <laughs> that, that something, you know, be at least plausible uh, and then maybe true. But at the basic level, it's it's seeing and knowing at this at this deeper at this deeper level. And can we do that? So I wanted to ask you, um, with with the aspect of the the allies of humanity, do they say that there's also other races that are not necessarily working with them, but have kind of a similar goal? Or is or are you saying the allies of humanity are the only ones that are reaching? To, reaching through to give the information to say, hey, watch out, there's more going on than what you can see. Um, sure. They don't they don't rule out that there are there might be others who would try to reach us for a beneficial purpose. Um, they just say that they are the association of they represent the association of free worlds in our in our immediate vicinity uh, who were called to be the allies of humanity. Um, could there be other messages in the future? Absolutely there could. Uh, in the end all these races can do is advise, you know, I mean, we're talking about a handful of individuals, not an armada of ships and craft uh, there. And so all they can do is advise and call upon us to claim the authority to be the native peoples and to take the action we have to take that in the end is what must happen, how it happens, who inspires it to happen. It's almost like, well, it just needs to happen. Um, I think the allies, themselves and their message is a, is an important part of that is an important spark in that process of waking up to the fact that you know we are being discovered on a beautiful planet that is desired by others that we are destroying in front of their eyes and that they want and that they're here to take um, that is the, the the fundamental awareness that a large number of people in the world need to have who don't yet have so i i feel like that's a mission right there to, to wake more people up to that. Um, what needs to happen after that, it's, it's many, many actions by many, many people and knowledge will be a key part of that. I mean, you're doing what you're doing because you have a gut sense that you should do this. It's not easy doing this to have a YouTube channel and record these and post produce video and, you know, spread this message, you know, and, and open up all these discussions. It's not easy. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you have a sense that this is important really important and must be continued. Uh, and I do as well. So this is, you know, knowledge. Right. Well, um, have they, have they r revealed basically what kind of some of their physical traits are the allies of humanity? Um, do they look similar to us? Um, would they truly be alien to us? Uh, do you have any information on that? They don't reveal their origin 
their planets of origin, the names of their races, their individual names, their morphology, their physiology, or any of that. Um, in part because we love that down here, right? Everyone just loves to create, you know, a pantheon of extraterrestrials visiting us and how they're all different, where they're from. It's, it's all, I mean, it's not going to help um, us reconcile what we have to do and what's really going on. So no, in short answer, they do not. Mm -hmm. I think we know a little bit about what the, um, the intervention looks like. There's a lot of accounts by abductees and others who have had physical contact with these beings. Um, so can you please go over that a little bit, if that's okay? I, I'm no expert in that. Um, but there are experts in that. Uh, David Jacobs comes to mind and, um, I've had the pleasure to speak with him on several occasions. Uh, and so what I know is mostly from the accounts of abductees and researchers like him. Right. So th basically, is it mainly because the way the allies of humanity approach this is to just say, hey, watch out, but they don't necessarily say who exactly? Am I, am I correct in assuming that? Yeah. I mean, it's you could, you could liken it to a whistleblower, right? I mean, if the whistleblower, mm -hmm. get, the people have to know what they have to know. It's so bad, right. it's so pervasive what's happening. So blow the whistle, you know, sound the alarm. The whistleblower will be destroyed should they be discovered. They will be terminated, right? Because the powers that are at work are such that they can do that. That's what the allies say. You know, if we were to give our planets of origin, there would be serious repercussions. If we were to try to mount a defense on your behalf, it would be something akin to war and there would be great destruction. And that's not how things even happen in life. Um, so they are kind of like um, whistleblowers, and um, in, in, as such, they don't reveal a whole lot about themselves. We do know a few things about them through the new message side of, of Marshall's work, um, but that's, that's, that's not essential to what their message is and, and the actions that need to be taken. Are there any kind of predictions as to when things might ramp up more to where it would become more obvious that there's more of a hidden hand at play uh, in terms of years? Or is it just kind of keep going, keep searching, and you will get to, to what you need to know? Um, there, no, the Allies have not said when this will, um, when the intervention will announce their presence more broadly or when certain stages of their plan will, will come into play into play, uh, they do say their, their plan is pretty well advanced. One thing we haven't talked about is the hybridization program, which has been underway for some decades to produce a human leadership that looks and walks and talks like us, but is fundamentally not aligned or allied to us. It's aligned to them. And that's a pretty dark thing to look at. And it's not very unfortunate, um, but that's pretty advanced. And what stage we are in that, where that, where those individuals are in the corridors of power, I cannot say. Um, so I don't think it's, I don't think the key is just to keep, keep trucking and just keep, you know, talking about contact and UFOs and UAPs. And, you know, it's really to go beyond the question of what is happening, which we've researched for decades, you know, all the phenomena associated with this to get to the next question of what do we need to do about it? And I don't hear people talk a whole lot about that, except, you know, invite contact, surrender to the visitors, you know, I mean, which are, these are not reasonable next steps. Those do not arise from a, a rational mind. <laughs> they are fundamentally irrational. Uh, and so I, it feels like things are stuck. They're stuck in this, what's happening and the government needs to tell us. and the ETs are probably here to save us or give us technology or heal the, you know, the world and teach us things. And so it's like we're stuck and we're loaded with assumptions that we can't get beyond. I would advocate getting over that hump and then getting down the road of, of taking action regarding the intervention specifically. Well, I know uh, because I've been into this and been talking to a lot of people and um, there's, there's always been this... Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the divide, but it's definitely been a source of um, of tension regarding the intentions of these different visitors. Because there, I've I've seen and heard both sides uh, basically put down a compelling case about. Um, I'm I'm not trying to kind of like d defend or be pro one or against the other, but for example, 
uh, almost everything. Um, I can't right on top of my head. I can't name you a lot, but perfect example that I can come up with immediately. Um, for example, to what Jacobs, uh, David Jacobs is saying, there's the opposite, which was Dolores Cannon, you know? And so both ends, you know, uh, basically talk about wanting to, to help, you know, it's just about, uh, you know, the other side goes one, watch out. There's, you know, this is what they're doing. And the other one goes like, yes, they are doing this, but there's more to it. And this is why. And so it's almost makes you think like, okay, well, where do you go? You know, that's what brings me back to, I guess we talked about this and I don't want to keep rehashing about then, okay, just follow your gut feeling then who do you, who do you follow? Or who do you, who, whose information do you take in? Yeah. I think it's a tall order to tell the world, follow your gut feeling. You'll know the truth. I mm -hmm. think the truth is so apparent that any reasonable thinking person who doesn't want something and have their own personal agenda from contact can easily see this for what it is. I've asked on many different shows, tell me, show me one thing the visitors are doing, doing, not saying, physically doing that signals a beneficial intent. They're flying in our skies unannounced, they're taking people, they're taking animals, they're manipulating governments, they're seeding all these disparate and false, well, competing narratives. Uh, they're doing all of that, okay, show me what they're doing that signals a beneficial intent. And then some people say, well, yes, people are being taken, but they made a soul contract before this life to be taken. And they're actually, they're being welcomed back, you know, into their brotherhood or into their spiritual, you know, network by being, it's like, okay, that is not a reasonable statement of fact <laughs> regarding how people are being taken. That, that is an association that's being made because somebody wants something from this. They want it to be good. They're trying to twist an actual physical event to be good when it's obviously not good. And so I personally, um, I, I, I've, I've kind of reached my limit of tolerance with the 50-50 the you know, argument, which is, well, they could be good, they could be bad. Some are good, some are bad. Some of what they're doing is bad, some of what they're doing is good. It's like wow, you can't see that there is an armed individual in your house, you know, taking your child now. <laughs> How have you been so disabled that you cannot see that and act upon it? And this is the pacification program. People are being disabled. Their, their core faculties are being disabled. Their basic native in, innate wisdom, like about how life works is being disabled. And so you have these wild beliefs about contact, uh, and but they're not the 50-50. They're not the other side of the argument, uh, in my view. Um, the, the picture is abundantly clear. Um, probably they're here to take what they want. They have an agenda. They're working with different groups for different reasons. Uh, they're not disclosing it. Uh, we, the people, have not been consulted. We're not being told what's happening, not just by government, but by the ET presence itself. All of that just points in a direction. But do we want to go? Do we want to look in that direction? That's another question. Everyone has a desire to see things a certain way. And when something really new happens, you have to abandon that in order to see it. I mean, you know, if a hurricane happens, but you really, really want it to be God. Everything that happens is God. God creates everything. Then you're going to call a hurricane God's wrath. And that's really unfortunate. And that is not the, 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 the logical other side of the coin. That is not the other side of the argument. Uh, that is an assumption leading to delusion. And so uh, I feel like that's largely what's taking over for those who are who are who have been in this field for a long time is they want to see it a certain way or they really don't want to see it a certain way they don't want to see this as a silent invasion because that's what it is because to see it that way would make you act right i go back to the 1930s how many germans saw the rise of the nazi party saw what they were doing it, it was all pointing in one direction right but told themselves another story. Well, no, wait, maybe they're here to bring back, you know, the German heartland and, you know, what's great about German people and our, and our basic values. Maybe they're trying to unite Europe around those, like, 
And of course, the Nazi party played into all sorts of narratives like that, right? But basically, people didn't want to see what was right in front of them. And it really was right in front of them the whole time. And, and look what happened. I go back to that time often these days because we're facing a force somewhat similar, uh, way more powerful and way more calculating with a much more complex and well-engineered script than the Nazis had, um, but similar in terms of the darkness of that force and what they intended to perpetrate. And the intervention is right up there, if not above that, probably is. And so that people can't basically see that is a problem. It's a problem in sight, actually, and being able to see. It's not a problem of needing more information or more disclosure. Do the allies of humanity give um, some kind of like uh, an event or something that that would be happening at certain times that would kind of help solidify that, oh, this is more of the work of the hidden hand? You know, uh, I know not necessarily predictions or time-wise, but do they talk about general events? The, the hidden hand of the intervention? No, do the allies talk about that, correct? To, to, to say, for example, like something, maybe, you know, maybe they might not have, or they, you know, otherwise you wouldn't mention it, but let's say they would say, you know, be wary of the government all of a sudden agreeing or not not rejecting your foes. That would be your first sign. They have given some, some benchmarks or signs that we can follow to understand where things are. Um, one thing is that they have said that at some point, the intervention will put an individual in the world who will claim to be the returning Messiah. And this individual will not be human. They will be a hybrid and they will have the powers of the visitors, but they will look human. They'll have the power to influence people's emotions, to project uh, psychic images or visions for people, very polarizing. Um, and so they have warned about the appearance of that individual, uh, a, a Jesus figure, although I, I think it could happen in many traditions. I don't think it would just be in the Christian world that that happens. Um, so the appearance of that person claiming that role and title would be one. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other specific specific events that take place. Um, yeah, I can't pull any off the top of my head. Oh, oh I'll, another I'll, one I'll, I'll throw in actually is that they have yeah, they have said that. Um, the United States was initially the target of the intervention, being the most powerful country in the world, clearly. Uh, and yet, in the end, the United States ended up resisting the intervention. And I don't know what component of the government did that. I'm sure I've sensed there were competing components, but the bulk response was, was repulsion of the intervention and resistance to it. That is partly why movements arose in the Middle East, were stirred up to embroil this country in conflict, very costly conflict, uh, to weaken this country financially, economically, and morally in the world. Um, so the, the radicalization of people who have religious beliefs is one part of what the intervention does. It's, it's actually, there are four activities of the intervention. One of them is tapping into our religious beliefs and traditions manipulating that either as a thing that the intervention can receive or benefit from, meaning we are the, we are the savior or the Messiah, um, or we are the brothers of the Galactic Federation. Or if that can't be, if it can't be turned in that way, to just turn up the dial on the extremism of that tradition and produce conflict that weakens the world, fractures the world, makes human institutions even more inept in the face of what's going on. So I think the wars in the Middle East were a sign of that occurring. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So basically, what, so roughly about 20 years ago is when that initial resistance happened then? Um, well, if we go back to 9-11 uh, and the wars that would follow, you could say that. Um, I can't personally say when it started, where, you know, okay. <laughs> or if the U.S. is not currently collaborating with them. Uh, there are multiple collectives in the world. It's worth noting this. It's not just one intervention. It's multiple collectives. They, they have the same overall goal. They want what this world has, and they want us as the workforce to get it for them. But they represent different networks of worlds, and so they are competing with each other, but the Allies do say they will collaborate at a certain point to win the race. 
Um, but is that behind some of the conflict we see uh, behind between the U.S. and Russia, for example, or the U.S. and China? Possibly. I don't know. I guess, you know, going back then to the very, very basic premise, then in a way, um, how small did you initially mention that this this group to be? Because if um, I mean, in, in in some way, if if uh, the good guys, let's say, see this, wouldn't that be really pre- a lot easier if they would just intervene? But they would just they what the, the whole premise is that they don't want this conflict because of this possible great war. So, first question: How large is the intervention? Um, I would put I would throw out a number of thousands initially. Um, but the Allies said, I was just reading it yesterday, that they year after year, they bring more. They bring more supplies. They've created establishments on multiple satellites and planets in our solar system and on the moon to observe. And so their, their facilities and infrastructure has grown over the last 50, 60 years. The Allies call it a dozen. Okay, These are whistleblowers. All they can do is alert, educate and encourage action. We've got 7 billion people. We got all the people we need to take action against several thousand. Um, but who would it be? I'm sorry to interrupt. Who would it be then, uh, since you said it's not uh, it's not uh, permitted to take a planet by force or take over a society by force, who would, for example, um, be to correct that? That's what I'm asking. So, I mean... Good question. Right. So the Allies give a whole set of teachings about what life is like around us. And that, that's a whole thing we could talk about for easily an hour. But in essence, the universe that we live in is highly inhabited, this, this part of our galaxy. There are very long-standing agreements surrounding trade. There are small, there are many nations that control maybe one or multiple solar systems and some small, what you might call empires, but there's no galactic federation. There's no true empire that controls swaths of the galaxy. It's much more of a medieval landscape, in fact, of little kingdoms that more or less stay to themselves, trade, and try to keep, you know, the marauders out. Now, marauders not in terms of, you know, those literally coming to destroy, it's more at the at economic marauders, those who are coming to weave themselves into your network, to make you dependent on them, to influence you to want what they have, all of that. It's a very mature um, form of conflict going on out there. Um, but the universe we're in is, is this environment where there's a lot of life, there's a lot of interaction and trade. There are, there's no great empire or you know force controlling everything. What there is, though, is there is an economic council that controls trade and governs how worlds interact for the sake of stability. And they are the ones that preside in this area in which we live. They are the ones who do not permit outright conquest because it would destabilize, you know, things. Uh, They do not want war. They do not want destruction. And yet they also acknowledge that there are, there is a certain amount of black market trade that must go on to keep, you know, the wheels turning. And so there's a lot that's, (laughs) that's allowed. You could say allowed. Um, but they cannot have outright war and conquest. That this this region of space in, that we are in has eclipsed that. Who knows how many tens of thousands of years ago? This is what the Allies say. And so we live in this tightly controlled environment where there are ways to gain access to emerging worlds with rich resources, but you have to do it a certain way. It has to be subtle. It has to be uh, undertaken quietly and secretly. The, the the, the whole part of genetic manipulation uh, is very real and is practiced pretty widespread out there, apparently, uh, and is more or less allowed and accepted. And so the intervention is, is operating off of an old playbook. It's an old playbook. It's like Chevron going into Venice, the Venezuelan jungle and they want to take the oil under the native's ground, but you have to do it a certain way, right? You can't just move in and, and destroy the environment and suck the oil out and collapse the country. You got to do it a certain way. And so these collectives operate along these very complex playbooks, um, which are not, they're, they're dark. I mean, it's very, very dark. Taking people against their will, um, taking their, you know, their physical body, their organs, selling their bodies and parts of their bodies. I mean, this is, there's a real dark underworld to what the intervention is doing. But in the greater community in which we live, 
it's quite common. Uh, I know this kind of blows up our, our hope that the universe was just way better than life here on earth and that it was spiritual and we're really low and it's really high and it's really not like that. Uh, it's nature out there. It's competition, survival of the fittest. Um, it's taken on a much more nuanced and higher level conflict has. It's not, you know, brutal and, and destructive. That's what we're kind of brutal and destructive down here in how we think. Um, some people say, I've heard this so many times over so many years, well, if they wanted to destroy us and take the world, they would have already done it and they haven't. So they must be here for our good. That is projecting our human understanding of conflict and force out onto space. What I say in response to that is uh, maybe we are part of the resource they want. So destroying us and taking the world, that's not what they're after. They want us. They want the biology of the world. And they have to operate by a very complex playbook to get it that we don't understand. And so, but when the allies, you know, reveal that, it's very helpful. Uh, it's very helpful to see that perspective, which, you know, we could never have otherwise. So uh, <clears throat> biology and um, sort of this kind of, um, uh, what was the other word I was going to say, um, genetic resources, is that basically like their version of our gold? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We think of resources as minerals and petroleum and, you know, for them, it's biology because the universe is is an environment of largely barren planets. There are very there are Earth like worlds are rare. They are there are many, but they are rare, and it is very rare for an environment to naturally allow or support the emergence of complex life forms. And so often, life is taken off those planets and seeded elsewhere. Often intelligence is seeded in races early on in their development to hasten the rise of their, of their capabilities. That has happened to us. Uh, we are the recipients of extraterrestrial um, genetics, but that was long ago by a whole other set of races who were not here for the planet and for us, um, us at that time being a few tribes in the jungle. There were no nations, there was no trade. The intervention now is here for the planet and they're here for us. And they're going to use what we have developed, which is trade, communications, this whole globalized world that we now have to extract what they want. And, uh, and largely that is biology, although it's also, it's also things to do with, you know, mineral deposits that are rare and, you know, that can be bought and sold. So there's a big market out there and Earth has a lot of product. And so um, we've been found. Uh, the allies do say that we this this world and this solar system is not largely known of uh, and that this it's actually been kept a secret out there that this place exists i'm sure because someone at some point uh, had designs but uh, an important thing to understand that may not make sense initially you know why wouldn't they just come down here either get us out of the way or you know work with us but take what they want why wouldn't they just extract what they want from the jungles and, and from the oceans and just and just take it and go? Part of it is that the scale of what they want to take is not just a couple plants, you know, like that movie E.T., you know, coming to the forest and taking a couple shrubs home. They want a lot more than that. Uh, second, we are part of the biology that they want. Right. And so today there are seven billion of us. All the better. Maybe. And then. Um, and lastly, they want what we've established, this network that we've established in the world. They want to use that because they themselves cannot live here. The biology of this world is both a benefit, but it's a double-edged sword. It's also, it's also an environment so complex with so many pathogens that they cannot protect themselves from all of those. They need us. We are adapted. They are not. So they cannot live here. So... This world that we now have in 2021, this globalized world, is a key part of what they're after. And this did not exist in 1950 or in 1900 or in 1800 or in 1200. It's only existed in the last few decades. And that, I think, was, was like a linchpin in their plan. They needed a whole world infrastructure that they could tap to get what they want from this place. So there's been... Um... There's been 
quite quite a bit of talk or more emergence, especially leading up to the <clears throat> to the UFO report regarding um, alien invasion. And so some are saying that uh, the government will use the alien invasion as a kind of false flag event to say we need more protection, and others say that no, that's a you know that's a valid valid um, uh, premise of a government to to have. Uh, what do you have any information regarding that? And which side of the coin, if I had to kind of say it that way, would the allies of humanity be on? Uh, well, we know which side the allies would be on. Um, you know, they're here because the intervention is here. What governments do, the agendas and conspiracies that they concoct to benefit from this or to get territorial acquisition or, you know, to punish longstanding hatreds and enemies. I mean, that's that's our that's that's for us to figure out. Um, I myself don't know quite where the government, this government, the U.S. government stands with the intervention. I would love for someone to reach out to me. Um, things like that have happened uh, in the past for us. Uh, but not recently. And so um, that would be good, uh, but it hasn't happened. So no one's, no one's calling me up to tell me where things stand uh, regarding collaboration or resistance on the part of the U.S. government. Um, I think I'm very wary when I see disclosure uh, because it looks, it looks it, like it's being meted out very carefully and it's being put out and, and shaped into a narrative that can be used. And that's part of the tricky thing about this Adnan, this whole field, is that um, it is a hall of mirrors stepping into this. I mean, there are competing agendas that have created the very conspiracy against them only so that they can control the resistance to them. Like the intervention mm -hmm. has created some of the conspiracies about negative ETs in the world and their agenda and all of this simply so they can control that narrative, keep it small keep it irrelevant, keep it weak. Um, so it's a hall of mirrors and it's very hard to know who's doing what. Um, I don't know if the intervention will take the right hand course of revealing themselves more broadly and publicly announcing that they're here for our good and public, like, taking that very public approach and getting all, all eyes on them. Or if they will stay subterranean, like a subcutaneous you know, autoimmune disease that you don't know you have, but you do, um, in which no one knows they're here except the ones they want to know. And they stay, it's very subterranean. 20 years from now, you walk down the street, it'll look just like this, you know, but it won't feel like this. <laughs> and quietly in back rooms, it won't be working like it was. Will they go left? Will they go right? My sense is they'll go left, uh, personally, that, that this will stay subterranean. Uh, and that's why part of what could be done is to just tell more people that contact is happening because that right there throws a wrench in the works of the intervention. They want to, I think, acclimate us very slowly, you know, as if you're in a pot of water that's lukewarm and then once a year it goes up one degree and you, you can't even feel the change. It's just, it, but it is going up and in the end you will boil, right? But you won't feel it until it's too late. That's my sense is they're going to go with that very incremental approach to acclimate people to their presence. That's certainly what they've been doing. Uh, and so to, to go more hands-on, you know, you use that, that phrase a little earlier, uh, and, and be more, more of an advocate, I think would be very good. And that would be a wrench for them. In, in, in their in their very in their meticulously created you know wheel the intervention the allies say um, they do not think creatively okay they are they do not even think as individuals this is a hive mind so when you do things that they're not expecting or they aren't in the playbook they do not know how to respond and so do things that aren't in the playbook that's what I think and they will not know how to respond. And uh, we become a more complex arrangement for them, less of a, you know, a, a turn switch or a, a turnkey solution for them. Uh, I think that's kind of where action needs to go.
So um, I hope I've, I've asked enough questions for those that are curious about, you know, who, what, when, where. Uh, my next set of questions I hope uh, uh, that we can maybe get into, I know it's a little bit later in, in the interview, but what is their uh, point of view on the general um, human being and soul and spirit in, in general? Um, is there, do you, can you speak on that? You know, kind of regarding, um, you know, because the belief is that we are souls, that we are part of the one and that we're all having our own individual experiences. Um, can they, have they spoken regarding that at all? They have, they have a lot. And I mean, this is where the new message from God comes in, which is really the affirmation that we are spiritual beings in the world. We were sent into this world at this time to play a unique part uh, in securing, you know, this learning opportunity for humanity, making this world a place where souls can come to realize and reclaim what they know and slowly over many lifetimes reunite with their source. This uh, is what the new message calls um, greater community spirituality. It's the spirituality of the universe. All sentient beings share this. It speaks of the separation from God that created the physical universe. Uh, the fact that we are all journeying across lifetimes, slowly reclaiming God into ourselves and ending the separation within us. And that this lifetime is an opportunity to continue that process, as is every lifetime. So um, the, there is a very spiritual and divine aspect to what the allies are doing. I mean, they are literally souls who responded to a calling from knowledge, the spiritual mind within them, to reach out to a young emerging world, to impart their wisdom, wisdom gained in very difficult way because their own races uh, had intervention in their worlds. And for some of the allies, they did not resist that intervention enough and their worlds were almost completely lost. And they were only won back through great struggle and great loss. So there's a lot of conviction that, that they've been called upon by a higher power to give to us. So there's a process of those who are mature, those who have achieved something, gained something, giving that down to ones who are just emerging, who are young and do not know what they're stepping out into. And that is triggered at this deeper level of knowledge. Um, so there is a soul reality uh, within each of us. The allies honor that and recognize it. Uh, in fact, they say that we are actually quite spiritually rich as a race. You know, we judge ourselves a lot down here. We think we're really low and violent and, you know, not worthy of, of anything godly or beyond, or that we need, you know, someone else to come here and redeem us. Actually, we're spiritually quite rich. Uh, we are a disorganized world of 7 billion warring peoples, nations, tribes. But that's slowly changing. We're slowly becoming, you know, a world community uh, with values that we share. And the allies say that that's actually a gift that we have that we could give out into the greater community. That this human race has something to offer, actually, extraterrestrial life that's out there. But to do that, we need to survive the process of first contact. So this intervention, um, do, do they say that they would also... Obviously, not to be outside of this overall creation, that they're also souls doing their part too. Um, is that is that the case, or is it? Are we talking about more like um, um, a, a creation that's more like AI doing its thing? Great, great question. Well, no, the intervention is composed of of physical life forms, physical sentient beings who also have knowledge, who also have the potential to express this same force of redemption or um, spiritual nature, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, however, and unfortunately, they, they come, they are part of worlds and, and groups in which their individual thinking and cognitive abilities have been genetically bred out of them. So they have lost their ability to think individually. They are part of a hive consciousness. At least the collectives are those these collectives that are you know undertaking this intervention. So um, the allies say um, they do not honor the soul in you. They do not honor the potential of you individually. They see you as a resource. Therefore, they need to be resisted. However, they do not need to be hated. They are not evil. 
They are physical beings with the need to survive and claim resources. I mean, this is nature taking place. Um, but they are not, they are not aware of what is truly good. They are delusional about what they think is good and they are doing damage. They are harming other beings. And so they must be resisted. Um, but the universe as the world is, is full of the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, everything, right? It's all out there. And at, but at its core, the universe is a place where redemption is meant to occur. I mean, that's actually the only reason the universe physically exists is because part of creation before time and space existed needed a place to be separate from the creator of all life. And that gets into the theology of the new message, which is quite deep. Uh, there's a book, Greater Community Spirituality, which is free online, which I recommend reading if you want that more that deep theological dive regarding the universe. Um, but the allies come in the spirit of that. They're very much a part of that process of the good expressing itself in a universe where many are, are not with the good within themselves. They're acting out of other motives. And yet the good over time grows and it grows. Uh, and at the scale of the universe, we're talking billions of years. So that's beyond my capability to even imagine, but uh, it is happening. And the intervention, though it looks really negative, and I don't want people to take this as a message of fear, because it's not. This is a message of destiny. I mean, we are meant to emerge into a larger universe. We are eclipsing our isolation that has been in place, not fully, but almost completely, for hundreds of thousands of years as an emerging species. We're making contact with the other 99.999% of what's out there. So this is, this is destiny that this happens. It's just that the first steps out are quite risky. If we can get beyond those first risky steps and repel this intervention, unify our world sufficiently, protect our environment, secure our self-sufficiency, the level of resources, then we can be a free world. We could essentially be an ally of humanity to another young race that is also in that process of stepping out. Would it um, that almost kind of, you know, makes me think of us, for example, you know, <clears throat> we, you know, we, we slaughter animals, you know, for food, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we are evil. You know, um, I've often said for myself, I can't speak for others that, you know, um, I have the ability to, but if I had to go and, and hunt, uh, you know, my own food, I'd probably be a vegetarian, you know, <laughs> because, you know, because it's the process of, you know, going out, uh, you know, looking at the other being and killing it so that you can consume it. And so, of course, we do it in this mass uh, process, you know, like slaughterhouses and whatnot, but, and we all end up, you know, it ends up at our table, but it doesn't mean that we're inher inherently evil. You know, we just, you know, that it's our kind of like blindfold to, so that because the urge to survive and live and continue to live is stronger than, than empathy in some way with that, with that animal, because, um, um, because a lot of us will look at look at that. And, you know, I've, I haven't known anybody that would say, "Oh yeah, let's just watch some videos of slaughterhouses." They would just be like, "God, that's horrible! I don't want to watch this," you know. And so, um, would would you say it's almost kind of like a similar approach to that to that intervention that they they just they just like you know just have this, I guess, lack of emotions, but then also just this natural way to just keep on living and surviving and doing whatever you have to do to, to keep, keep your existence going. Yeah. Um, uh, well, they are, they are surviving. Um, there are a couple things that differentiate this from our consumption of animals. Um, the first is that we are sentient beings <laughs> and, you know, it is inherently an abomination to kill a sentient being for their resources, even if it's for your consumption. I think we all kind of know that uh, at a gut level, you know, cannibalism is not a good thing, right? Can, can you please define sentient before you move on? I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt. Me, meaning kind of a, a reason and thought as opposed to what we uh, perceive in animals that they don't necessarily have it on the same level as we do. Is that what you mean? I, I would say a capability, an intellectual or a capability that allows a soul to inhabit the body and to express the soul's will in separate, in physical form. 
Okay. Um, so yes, I mean, you could commonly call it intelligent race, um, but you know, um, we are sentient. So we, we do possess a soul that is attempting to express itself through this opportunity of life. Um, and so the intervention is, is killing, taking and killing and terminating those people and taking away their opportunity for life. So that is inherently wrong. Um, and also, um, they're not consuming us for their survival. They're, they're taking us for their benefit, their expansion, and the fulfillment of their ideals, whatever those may be, whatever it, whether it's you know, expanding their, little, their empire or enriching their customers and their own selves. It's enrichment and expansion. Um, it's not base survival. But yeah, I, I get what you're asking, and and you know you're making me cringe a little bit thinking of slaughterhouses. Um, and it is, you know, it's 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 a question we all have to ask, you know, which is what are, what are we willing to do to another creature? I think I'm pretty sure I'm I'm pretty certain I know what I can and cannot do to another being. Um, <laughs> and but their value system is not our value system, and they do not think of us as beings with souls. Who deserve to live we are critters on the ground to be used and that that is that is to be rejected i feel for us um as as i mean that if you if you allow that i mean you know good luck and you know, allowing yourself to the intervention well reed uh, do you have any uh, concluding thoughts uh, and uh, then if you could also please finish up with with the different websites and more information where people sure. can go well, and read. Sure. Well, I was actually going to say in the very beginning, you know, about myself, because I didn't say all that much. You know, in some ways, I'm, I'm very much like many of, of you out there. Um, I am connected to the reality of life in the universe, and I know it. And it would be strange to be in the world to not have that connection. It would feel like I'm not me. And so, you know, I'm also seeking to find, you know, what contact means for me and how I'm connected to this, because I do feel like I was sent into the world to be a part of this in some way. And I think other people feel that. And it's hard to walk, walk around with that. You know, very, there's very little that affirms that part of your deeper nature. Um, and so if, if this has your name on it, this whole reality of contact, humanity's future in space, then stay with it because it's a part of you and the future needs you. The future needs this, these few people, these forerunners to hold this reality, to learn what it means to respond to it uh, because eventually all of humanity will be responding to it and it'll be the, the acknowledged and accepted norm. But if these few people in the beginning did not see it clearly and respond at the level of knowledge within themselves, there may not be a norm. There may not be a humanity, <laughs> believe it or not. Enslavement is a real possibility, is what the allies say. So people who feel this connection are very important. That's all I want to say. And I want to acknowledge them and affirm that what they are knowing is real and that the truth is there. It's in them and that knowledge within them will guide them to what they need to find. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, if you could, uh, um, I'm, of course, I'm going to have it in the description below, but if you could please uh, go over your websites and uh, the, the different information that you would like people to see. I would appreciate that. Okay, yeah. So the Allies of Humanity briefings are at alliesofhumanity.org. There are four sets of briefings. Uh, they're translated into numerous languages. They're all free online for you to read and to download. So I encourage you to read the Allies briefings. The New Message from God, also received by my father, Marshall Vion Summers, is at newmessage.org. There are hundreds of revelations up there for you to read that are part of this whole picture that's unfolding about the greater community, our emergence into it, and how knowledge that the knowledge we carry is connected to that. And then lastly, the human sovereignty, the declaration of human sovereignty, a document written by a group of individuals some years ago, uh, modeled on the United States Declaration of Independence, uh, is at humansovereignty.org. Print it, put it on your wall, put it on a flyer, on a bulletin board, uh, help other people see the picture that's unfolding before our eyes regarding who's in our world and what they're doing and why. So those are the resources. And I also want to just throw in, um, there's, there's a community of people worldwide who are responding to all of this. So, you know, we're not alone 
uh, in responding to the allies briefings or the new message. Um, there's a whole community of people, many hundreds of people around the world studying, sharing, advocating. Uh, and so there's a lot to be a part of as well. Well, Reed, thank you very much for all the information. I appreciate you again for taking the time to talk to me today. And um, also thank everyone else for watching. And um, so until next time, have a good day. Thank you, Adnan. Good to be with you.